the glory that shall be revealed in us, the big picture. This sermon today is still a part of this culture of victory. I was just glad to see everybody shouting and praising the Lord. Yeah, everybody, you were praising God today like winners. So you, 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 you were shouting like a champ. Amen. Rejoicing like you know that victory is around the corner. And I called uh, Sister Marlene back and I whispered in her ear. I said, get that microphone and, and ask, ask the, the pertinent question of the song. Why should I wait? Why should I wait? Why? If I'm uh, not going to wait till the battle is over and, and shout now, then, then the, the, the important question is, why should I wait? I'm going to praise his holy name. I'm going to praise him right now. Why should I wait? I said, drive that home. Why should I wait? That, and she did a super job with it. Uh, and thank God for the rest of the choir falling in line and the band. Why should I wait? See, um, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a mindset that, that a winner has. And, and, in, and in gaining the victory, you got to see a thing before you see it. Or you may never see it. You have to, you have to know how to believe God. One of the things that winners, achievers, people who make things happen, people who get things done, people who overcome, people who endure, people who love the Lord, one of the things that they do is that they keep in mind the big picture. If they lose sight of the big picture, they don't allow themselves to lose sight of it for long. They don't allow themselves to get mired down in the minutia of things. Amen. Not that big picture thinkers aren't detailed, but you can't let the lesser things crowd out. The less important things crowd out or replace the things of greater importance. Some of us get bent out of shape dealing with things that really, at the end of the day, don't matter. Just think of how much time you invest in fleeting things. Things that a day from now won't matter whether it happened or not. Amen. Sometimes people literally shorten their lifespan by being in anxiety and depression and worry over things that six months from now, nobody will even know happened. Sometimes six minutes later, it's as though it never was. Some people will allow someone to cut them off on the way to work to ruin their whole day. You, can, or you, 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 you worked all day thinking about that person who cut you off. Six months ago, somebody flipped you the bird on the freeway, and you're still trying to find that car. <laughs> Minutia. Things that have no eternal moment. Things that regardless to how they turn out, doesn't matter. Amen. Big picture people, we all have them, but we know how to keep those things uh, separate. The Apostle Paul said to Timothy concerning the work of the divine infantry. God has an army. Paul said to Timothy, no man that warreth entangleth himself in the affairs of this life that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. He didn't say that no man that warreth avoids the affairs of this life because if you're in this life, you got to deal with the affairs of this life. But if you are a warrior in God's army, you don't get entangled, that is interwoven to the point where you become one with the affairs 
of this life. God bless Prophet Holly. Honor to have you, sir. You may join us up if you like. You don't want to become so entangled with this world that worldly things become you. And you become worldly things. Amen. That, that your priorities now are the things of the world and not the things of God. When you become intertwined like that, it, it affects you. It negatively affects you. And it, and it hinders your ability to please him who have called you to be a soldier. For some calling, some, some assignments that God gives soldiers are assignments that may clash with some of the worldly things that are in our lives, some of our personal goals, some of the things that, you know, I want to be this or that, or, or I've set a goal in my life that by a certain time I want to be at this level and by, by another uh, certain time I want to be at that level, so forth and so on, and, and you're rigid with that. But that's, that's the affairs of this life. What if the Lord calls and says, no, I want you to do this over here. Well, Lord, if I, if I give attention to this, I can't meet my timetable over here. And God says, all right then what are you going to do? Because I'm calling you to do this. Amen. Sometimes a call into the ministry is a call to emptying your bank account. Going broke, almost about to lose everything. Trying to get that church off the ground that you know God called you to. And if you are too involved, in the affairs of this life, you will calculate and then listen to the voice of reason and say, I can't afford to make that move. And you fail to make it, but you've just missed God because he gave you an assignment as a soldier. Good soldiers never retreat until their commanding officer says retreat. Good soldiers, if you say take that hill, they die trying to take that hill. Amen. They, they die. They fall forward, but they don't retreat. The retreating soldier is a deserter. The, 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 the soldier who retreats because he puts his welfare ahead of the orders will be court-martialed. Am I right about that? God bless our members of law enforcement who every day put the badge on, strap on the gun, look at their wives and families and kiss them goodbye. Tell them on the way out the door, I'll see you for dinner, not knowing whether or not they'll actually come back home. There has to, something has to happen on the inside of you to be able to do something like that. Our Lord said it this way. He says, that was 2 Timothy 2 and 4. Our Lord said this, he also that received seed among the thorn is he that heareth the, heareth the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. Matthew's gospel, chapter 13, verse 22. There are those, the seeds that fall, that fell among the thorns are people who hear the gospel. But the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and they become unfruitful. Paul lamented. He said this in a lamenting tone. He said, Demas have forsaken me. Demas deserted me, having loved this present world and is departed to Thessalonica. Oh, you ought to make sure there's no Thessalonica in your life. He left and he went to Thessalonica. One writer said that perhaps Demas viewed Thessalonica as a safe haven. He viewed Thessalonica as good ground. He viewed Thessalonica as a place where um, 
Perhaps maybe Thessalonica was his hometown. Because if you read in the book of Philemon, you see that at the, the conclusion of the book, the second to the last verse of the book, uh, says when Paul mentions, he mentions Aristarchus and Marcus, and he also mentions Demas as being one of the brethren who salutes the people. Demas went back home. Demas did determine that the fire to serve the Lord was too hot. And he forsook the Apostle Paul. 2 Timothy 4 and 10. And then the Hebrew writer said it this way. He says, wherefore seeing that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. This is Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. He had just finished chapter 11 talking about all of the those who made the hall of faith and who had achieved great things through faith. The Hebrew writer says, seeing that we're surrounded, uh, you sport fans, he gives the, the metaphor, the simile of a stadium, a stadium filled with uh, people, people in the stands who made it. Uh, Samson, Gideon, Moses, and all of the saints of old were in the stands cheering us on. They're in the stands now. Ella Turner is in the stands. Bishop Mason is uh, in the stands. Just, we just call the names of those who are up there saying, we made it, so can you. Uh, he says, seeing that we're uh, compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, he says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin. The weight is an encumbrance. An encumbrance. Weight literally means something not bad in and of itself. The weight can actually be something that is innocent and harmless, but it diverts our attention from the things of God. Weights are things in your life that divert your attention, that saps your energy, that dampens your enthusiasm for the things of God. The weight can be your television. The weight can be your friend. The weight can be your affection for someone or their affection for you. Ask yourself, am I a weight in someone's life? A weight, a weight comes from a Greek word that literally means bulk. A, tr a world-class track star was invited to uh, a race, and he ran. It was a 100-meter race, and he's world-class, ranked number one in the world, and he lost. And they interviewed him afterwards and says, why do you think, why do you think that you lost the race? He says, uh, it's, it's simple. He says, I was too heavy. He wasn't, and he wasn't grossly out of weight, just a few pounds, just a few pounds made him too heavy. Some of us aren't obese, spiritually speaking, but some of us are just a few pounds too heavy to run this race with patience. Got just a little too much going on. Too many irons in the fire. Too many, praise the Lord, things happening. They've overloaded you. And that joy that you used to have for the Lord, it's gone. Praise the Lord. That shout, it's gone. And you can't hardly put your finger on, well, what happened? Where did it go? Now, Lord, I'm not drinking. I'm not smoking, I'm not fornicating, I'm not dipping, I'm not chewing, I'm not involved in homosexuality, lesbianism, I'm not in perversion, I'm not, I'm not, I haven't killed anybody. Where's my joy? Sometimes the culprit is not anything in your life that is a sin in and of itself, but it's just, it's just that you got too many good things going on. Too many, you, you're involved in too many things. You're involved in too many good things. You're on this committee and that committee. 
You're running for this board and that board. You're getting your, your, your hands are over here and your, your hands are over there and you're doing a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And oh my Lord, you are Mr. and Mrs. Uh, got it going on and you're into so much, but that is a way. One text too many. One email too many. One phone call too many. It becomes a way. And the Bible teaches that uh, wherefore seeing that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. We got to unload some of this bulk. We're too heavy. There are some positions in life that doesn't require muscle culture. Doesn't require big muscles. Praise the Lord. Forearms. And a matter of fact, it'll work against you. That's why you don't see a bulked up quarterback. Quarterback out there trying to throw the ball look like Mr. Olympia. No, that don't happen. The pitcher, no, that doesn't happen. Because it doesn't fit certain things. Praise the Lord. Spiritually, don't get too bulky. Don't get involved in too many things. Some people in your life, they aren't sinful in and of themselves, but they drain you. When they finish with you, you have nothing left. That's a weight. That's a weight. Praise the Lord. So he says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily entangle us. I'm going to preach in just a minute. And let us run with patience. Patience here is endurance. And uh, endurance is the steady determination to keep going. The steady determination to keep going. I've got to, you should say to yourself, Keep going. I can't let anybody turn me away from the Lord. I've got to keep going. God give me strength to keep going. Whoever stops going, that's on them. But Lord give me strength to keep going. To maintain the steady determination to keep going. To continue when everyone else is saying, slow down. This is a slow down world when it comes to the things of God. They don't slow down when it comes to drinking. The hip hop artist doesn't slow down. Liars don't slow down. Prostitutes don't slow down. LBGTQ community don't slow down. Hollywood pumping out their filth don't slow down. But the devil tells the believer, slow down. Slow down. Slow down. Our sons and daughters are conquered in schools. They're crushed because their unsaved counterparts are loud. We teach ours to be quiet. The unsaved, unsaved counterpart is a megaphone for wickedness. We teach ours to be whisperers for righteousness. But oh no, there comes a time when the believer has got to step up, say what need to be said, and say it the way it should be said, with power and authority. Let, let me carry on. He says, let us run this race that is set before us. Uh, and uh, he says here, praise the Lord, we're going to lay aside every sin and that's thus so easily beset us, and let's run the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. I'm talking about the big picture. Looking unto Unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. What did he do? Who, for the joy, he kept the big, he, he, he kept his eyes on the big picture. For the joy that was set before him. You see that? What did he do? Endured the cross. See, the way you go through, you go through not looking at what it is that you're dealing with. You got to know how to look beyond that. I got to look to the other side of this and, and see where I'm headed. See, because if, if I can just keep my eyes on the prize, I will get 
there. But I can't, I can't do like Peter did when he was walking on the water. Peter began to walk on his way to Jesus, but the Bible says he began to notice the, the wind, the rain, the, 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 the storm, the thunder. He began to pay attention to things that were there all the time. The devil hadn't just become the devil. Attacks haven't just uh, bro, uh, just started happening to believers. Wickedness hadn't just arrived. It's been here all the time. But the, the, the problem is now you're paying more attention to it. It has gotten your attention. Put your eye back on the prize. Praise the Lord. Don't let the devil divert you. Don't let the devil distract you. Keep your eyes on Jesus and then imitate him for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. Don't get me to preaching about how painful that was. Well, how did he feel about what he went through? He despised the shame. Jesus wasn't happy to be hung up there naked in front of his mother and, and in public. And the, the soldiers had spit upon him. They had beaten him. They had, they had taken his clothes and, 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 and gambled for his garment. They, they drove nails in his hand, nails in his feet. Oh, my, he was swollen. His back was, was ripped open like ground beef. Oh, he was alone. How did you feel about it, Jesus? The Bible says he despised the shame. There's things about every vocation that's not pleasant. You got to know how to deal with the unpleasantries of what it is you do, but keep doing what you do. See, some of us quit as soon as the thing becomes unpleasant. That's why you never, you never achieve a high goal. You're sitting around waiting for someone else to do it for you. No, even when it becomes unpleasant, you still got to stay the course. Stay the course because storms come up. Praise the Lord. Seasons change. Unpleasantries happen. But if you keep going, you're going to get there. He endured the cross, despised the shame. But where is he now? And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Then the, then the, then the Hebrew writer says, For consider him that endured such Contradiction. King James says contradiction. Consider him who endured such hostilities of sinners against himself. Lest you be weary and faint in your mind. He says before you give up, before you throw in the towel, before you quit, before you go serve another false, go serve a false God, before you get caught up in something that you ought not, consider Jesus. Let, let, let Jesus be your model. Pay attention to what Jesus did. Praise the Lord. Jesus didn't quit. He fainted. He collapsed. He fell on his face in the Garden of Eden. He had questions. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? He, he, he operated in solitude and loneliness. Yeah, he did. He wept. Yeah, he did. He went through, he know what it's like to be betrayed. Yes, he does. But I'll tell you what he didn't do. He didn't quit. He kept his eyes on the big picture. Big picture, looking to Jesus. Big picture, consider Jesus. We must maintain the ability to keep the main thing. The main thing. That is, how about majoring in majors? And if you have to minor at all, let it be in minors. But never minor in major things. Praise the Lord. You don't hear what I'm saying today. This is how we win, how we achieve, how we make things happen, how we get things done, how we please the Lord. By, praise the Lord, proper prioritizing. In our text, you don't like this preaching today. In our text, the apostle moves into the realm of the mystical. An area fraught with both delight and danger. He allows us to peep into his mind. 
into his thoughts and peep into his reasonings. In our text, we are allowed to see his prioritization of life. For we hear him as he mulls over some things. You know, it's sort of like David was. Let me digress just for a moment. In Psalms 73, David uh, lets us uh, peep into his mind. He says in Psalms 73 and um, in verse 12, he says, Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. It seemed like to me these ungodly, David says, who prosper in the world, they increase in riches. You've seen wicked folk who, who just get ahead. You know they ain't right, but everything works out for them. Oh, that, that'll mess with your head. Amen. Amen. There he goes in his brand new Bentley, and you know he's a liar. Amen. Amen. Uh, an embezzler, but has got it going on. And here you are living holy, and, and here's the one, and paying your time. But your car broke down on you, and you just don't understand. Well, David was there, and he says, Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, look at what he says about himself. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain. That is, I've gotten saved for nothing. There haven't been a payout in my turning to the Lord. I've gotten saved in vain and washed my hands in innocence. Otherwise, I clean my life up. I clean myself up. I'm, I'm, I'm going to church. I'm, I'm attending up a room. I'm listening to the pastor. You know, he preach all day. I'm, I'm going to church. And it's for nothing. Then he says, for all day, for all the day long have I been plagued. And chastened every morning. I wake up depressed. I've been going through, he says. Then he says this. If I say, I will speak this. If I, if I actually say how I feel, behold, I should offend against the generation of that people. So I'm going through all this and I can't even say how I really feel right now. And when I thought to know this, when I tried to think it through, he says, it was too painful for me. I can't handle this, but thank God he didn't stay home. Thank God he didn't stay out that Sunday. He said, until I went into the sanctuary. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I therein. See, if you just stay in church, just stay in the word, oh, it'll, it'll work out. It'll make sense to you. But, but you, can't, you can't let the devil separate you. That's a, that's a trick of Satan. You got to know, you got to understand the importance of staying in place. He says, now I understand. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. And thou didst cast them down to destruction. How they are brought into desolation. As in a moment. It doesn't even last long. They are utterly consumed. And he says this in his conclusion. Verse 27. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee. But... It is good for me to draw near to God. For I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare thy works, all thy works. Isn't that amazing? He, he comes to the, to the conclusion. The answer is it's not for me to drift away, but for me to get closer. It's not for me to move away from the Lord, but to come closer to God. And I say to you, this is the same answer. And we see Paul here in his deliberation of things. We see him move with care and reverence as he considers God's marvelous provisions and our human limitations and what we are to look forward to. So he says, praise the Lord, as he's being mystical and cerebral, he's thinking, he says, for I reckon, I, I reckon, I count, I, I 
figure this up. I, I estimate. See, you, I, you know, I always tell you, Christianity is the ultimate thinking man's religion. If you don't use your mind, you won't do good in this religion. Praise the Lord. See, it, it, it's for the thinker. And, and, and for those of you, well, those churches who preach that, that, that faith is the absence of thinking, you are misleading people. It, it takes faith to be a great thinker. Praise the Lord. To reason. Amen. The Lord deals with our minds. Paul says here, I'm counting this thing up. I'm, I'm thinking. He says, so I, I, I estimate, praise the Lord, uh, that the sufferings of this present time. He's given thought to this. And, and keep in mind, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. So we see the combination of the apostles' thoughts along with the Lord, God, the Holy Spirit, helping him to get a message to us. It says this, I, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. The big picture is not whether or not everything, whether or not we get everything we want in this life. I said to the Lord, I said, God, when I preach this, they're not going to shout. He said, don't worry about it, but I, I, I didn't know you were going to be this dry. <laughs> Say amen. But the big things, the big picture... It's not whether or not we get what we want, nor is it whether or not you marry and have children. It's not the big picture. Nor is it whether or not you become rich and famous. Nor is it, is it whether uh, uh, we become the best in the world at our chosen uh, field of endeavor. Nor is it the things that the world dangles before us. The world tells us what greatness is. I, I'm, I'm amused when I hear football players opine and they speak with such loftiness on greatness. To be great, you must do this. And to be great, you must do that. And I guess they think they're great because they're in the football hall of fame. And what a narrow definition of greatness. They don't know greatness. They don't know greatness. They know a game, but that's not greatness. You, well, I look at this person, I consider them Great. They may have accomplished some wonderful things, but if you miss this, you will truly miss what life is all about. Amen. These things are not, praise the Lord, the big picture. Instead, the big picture is something that is seldom preached. It's seldom taught. Keep in mind, it affects everything, however, that we do. The big picture. If it is kept in mind, it will inspire us regardless to what happens to us in this life. If you keep the big picture in mind, it wards off hopelessness. It will ward off depression and pessimism. If kept in mind, it will keep you going until the end. If kept in mind, it keeps you inspired to be all that you can be in this life for the Lord, for your family and loved ones for your church and for the nation. If kept in mind, it prevents bitterness from grabbing hold of you. Many people are bitter because they are locked into something that happened to them that they won't let go of. But that thing is not the big picture. Are you with me? If kept in mind, you'll always wake up on the sunrise side of the mountain. If kept in mind, when we die, we die satisfied and reaching forward. If kept in mind, it causes us to view our sufferings properly. Praise the Lord, because you know it's, it's fashionable now for everybody to talk about what they're going through. But you got to see it right. Because when you see when you view this thing, this thing properly, you come to the conclusion that you're not going through very much at all. For Paul said, Paul says, my testimony is not that I've suffered more than anyone else. Paul says, my testimony is I've come to the conclusion that the sufferings of this present time 
are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. It's a mystical thing. It's a mighty thing. It's a cosmic thing. It is a heretofore, Paul says, an unseen thing. A long-awaited thing, a thing that's highly anticipated. There is something that God has for me up the road that makes all of this that I'm going through now nothing by its comparison. There is a glory that shall be revealed in us. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Verse 16 through 18, he says, For which cause we faint not? For though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction. When was the last time you heard somebody suffering call it a light affliction? We're in love with our afflictions. Oh, we can tell these sad stories. Paul says, For our light afflictions. Oh, we've been suffering for such a long time. Paul says, which endure but a moment. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's light and it don't last long. So you got to change your perspective. Well, Pastor, I've been suffering all my life. You're looking at it the wrong way. You haven't been suffering all your life. You, you go, you, you'll go through your share, but it's a light affliction, which endures but a moment. Mm, good God Almighty. There's my light affliction which endure for a moment. He says, worketh for us a far more exceeding weight of glory. How many, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be something? You're talking about shouting. You're talking about dancing. You're talking about waving both hands and getting happy. Wouldn't it be something if we really believe, if we really, truly, honestly believe that the adversity that we're facing right now is actually working for us. Praise the Lord. Oh, it would be very different if we really believe that it's working for us. Uh, well, Pastor, you know, somebody's working against me. I can tell. Someone's out to get me. Someone's talking about me. Someone's plotting against me. Not everybody is with you. And all that, look, let me tell you something. All that may be true, but at the end of the day, it's all working for me. And it's all working for you. And you got to grab that thing, and you got to believe it, and you got to let it change. Change your view of life. That child that is sick, that husband that is suffering, that loved one who died, the things that are happening, you got to understand that God has a way of causing all of that stuff to work for you. And it works for us whether we understand it or not. It works for us whether it makes sense right now or not. It works for us whether we're in pain right now or not. But it helps you when you're going through. If you can faithfully say to yourself, this is as I moan and as I groan. I can't shout like I used to and I'm going through. But I know that somehow this is working for me. And it's not just working for me, but it's working for me and exceeding. Uh, it means working for me a whole lot. <laughs> an exceeding weight of an exceeding and eternal glory. This momentary trial is working in an eternal glory. This momentary lightweight trial is working and exceeding an eternal glory on my behalf. So the question is, why should I wait? Don't wait till the battle is over. Shout now. Why should I wait when I realize? Oh, when I realize that it's working for me. I want, a, I want a few folk to praise God for it working for you. Yeah. Glory to God. But now listen to this here. Listen now. Now the, the, now the clincher. Here's the challenge. Here's the, here's the challenge. Here's the hook. Uh-huh. 
Praise the Lord. But you got to develop something. You got to develop a certain kind of sight. Because if you don't develop this sight, you won't see it. You'll stand there and try to act happy, but you won't be. You'll stand there and wave your hand to help me get through. And I thank you for that, but you won't get through. Unless you develop a certain kind of sight. For the 18th verse says, while we look not at the things that are seen, but uh, at the things which are not seen. See, you can't just concentrate and keep your eyes on everybody and everything negative and everything that's going on in your life that you don't like and you're paying attention to this one and to that one. Praise the Lord. There's always somebody who feel like they're anointed to come in your life and to tell you who's not with you, who's not for you, who's against you. Let me help all of y'all. I know that everybody who's around me is not for me. I know, praise the Lord, everybody who say I love you don't love you. I'm not blind, but I know who does. Hey! Jesus loves me. Somebody shout, yeah! And that's true for all of us. So if the Lord is for you, then you got to learn how to see beyond this other stuff and see the things that the that the carnal can't see. See the stuff that the worldly can't see and learn how to see how God is working it out. The songwriter said, I see God. I see God working it out for me right now. And other people in your life, they may look around and all they see is disaster. All they see is catastrophe. All they see is trouble. Then they look at you and say, what did you say you see again? You said, I see God. Working and working and working and working. Ah! Ah! Working and working and working and working. Somebody praise him right now. Hallelujah. And the things that I can see with my naked eye, they are temporal. But what God is working for me, I know why it's hard for this thing to over. To, 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 to get you happy because we let some charlatans cause us to take our faith from what God has for us in eternity and to measure our salvation solely by what's going on on this side but this life is just a speck it's a speck of time that won't last very long. But I'm glad to know that there's somebody here who's living in such a manner that they're living to live again. I remember when I heard Ella Turner preach, I'm living to live again. And then I heard the old Methodist say, I'm sending up my timber every day. How many are living to live again? And you're learning to get your joy from, from being able to look beyond, to just look beyond what the devil is trying to do and see the glory of God working in your life right now. And I heard John, the writer, John said it good. And I'm about ready to close this thing. I won't get to all of it today. But I heard John said, behold, what man of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. John said, just think about the love that God the Father has given us that we should be called the sons of God. And therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Then he says, behold, he says, beloved, he says, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear 
what we shall be but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is and then I heard him say and every man that hath this hope in him doth purify himself other words if you want to see Jesus if you want to be like him if you want to see him in the end you work on yourself now you get everything that's not like Jesus you ask God to take it out I prayed this morning I said Lord everything that's not like you take it out of me every desire every thought every craving everything that is contradictory because I want to keep my eyes on the big picture I'm living to live again the Lord is good and worthy to be praised I want somebody today who understands what I'm saying to pray the same prayer ask the Lord right now clean me up dust me off make me ready somebody say yeah yes oh lord let me just say this about paul and then i'm gonna close here today paul was not blessed he was not blessed with a high a super high pain threshold it wasn't that he enjoyed hurting neither was he slightly masochistic Paul wasn't in love with pain and suffering, but rather he carefully looked at and considered what awaits the believer. And he concluded that as we suffer here, one day in God's presence, we'll pay for it all. I heard David say, for one day in thy courts, is better than a thousand elsewhere one day with jesus is better than a thousand days with someone else and he said i'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my god than to dwell in the tents of wickedness otherwise he said i'd rather be god's usher i'd rather be on god's hospitality team i'd rather be a doorkeeper I'd rather be God's greeter on the door of his house than to be a ruler in the world of the wicked. I wonder today how many are glad, glad to be saved, glad to serve in the Lord's church. You don't envy the lost. You don't wish you were out there, but you're glad that you're in here. I'd rather be here right now than at any football stadium. I'd rather be here in the pulpit than to be on the 50 yard line. I'd rather be here in the house of God than to be courtside at the NBA finals. I'd rather be here with the saints of God than to be at, praise the Lord, the Academy Awards with the wicked for one day in thy presence one day in your court it's greater than a thousand one day with Jesus it's gonna pray for it all somebody say yeah yes Woo! look at your name and say pastor is preaching about the big picture today the big picture the big picture. So Paul here, and I gotta stop, but I heard Paul say, he said, now, now, let me tell you, it's not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. He says, for the earnest expectation of the creature. Paul said, what you need to know is all of creation, the atmosphere, the galaxies, the Milky Way, our solar system, the sun, the moon, the seas, and all that are therein. Everything, everything God Almighty waiteth for, is waiting for the manifestation 
of the sons of God. It is true. Everything revolves around the church. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from that wicked way. The Lord says, I hear from heaven. Forgive the sin and heal the land. Isn't that something? Look at the power that the saints have. The whole created universe is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. I'm, I'm just like, I'm just like uh, Brother Harvey Watkins told him, don't call, don't call the roll until I get there. Hallelujah. He says they're, they're waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature, the creation was made subject to vanity. Remember, God cursed the ground. See, these, these global warming tree huggers, they have, they have a point, but they miss the main point. See, the, the main point is not uh, a problem with the internal combustion engine. Pollution, environmental abuses. I didn't say these things didn't matter. Praise the Lord. They found out that the aerosol spray can deodorant was messing up the ozone layer. They had to, they had to cut that out. And there are other things. Some some corporate corporations are big time polluters. Am I right? Dump things in the water. Oh my. And thank God for those who fight against that stuff. But that's not the main cause. I'm, I'm moved by when I see people, politicians and the like, who are, who say we got to save the planet. We got to save the planet. But they're for same-sex marriage. They're for abortion. They are for all kinds of sin, but they say we got to save the planet. Well, where, where was the car? Where were the corporate polluters? Where was the aerosol spray can? Where was all these things when God said to Adam, the ground is cursed for your sake. Where was all these things? No, they didn't exist. And God cursed the ground. Well, what existed? Sin. Sin. That's the problem. Sin. Sin. The creation was made subject to vanity through man's sin. And notice the play on words. See, I can't hoop this part. It says, for the creature was made subject to vanity. Notice this. The universe didn't want to. Not willingly, but by reason of him who subjected it. Now, the him is not God. But the him is Two people. Adam You know who the other person was? Adam. For my eight o'clockers, you own to it because you know, even though we ain't talked about it today, we've talked about it. If you don't come to eight o'clock, you may not know. See Adam is bro both a noun and a proper name. That's right. The first man, Adam, calls the ground to be cursed. Adam is the proper name for the first man, Adam. But Adam also means mankind. 
So Adam, first man Adam, caused the ground to be cursed. But Adam, ever since the first man Adam, have been sinning and ignoring God and, and abusing the covenants and disregarding the Lord. Adam sinned so bad in Genesis chapter 6 that God looked at Adam, the human race, and said every thought of man is evil continually. I regret that I made man. I hate that I made Adam. I hate that I made mankind. Adam. But there was one member of Adam who saved us all that day. And his name was Noah. And the Bible says, Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. And that man, a part of the Adam race, human race, mankind and his family was spared. But look at what Adam has done ever since. Man is both culprit and victim of nature's wrath. We caused it and we're victimized by it. We live in a sinful world. We live in a world that causes the created universe to vomit. Sometimes when we give the created universe an upset stomach, it manifests in the form of a tornado or an earthquake or those Santa Ana winds that begin to blow and the winds blow so strong that it makes the dry brush rub against each other. And as they rub against each other, fire stops. And the Santa Ana winds just flame the fire. Whole communities and people are burned to death. Houses go up in smoke. Sometimes because of man's sin, we're both culprit and victim. Lightning strikes and sets a thing ablaze. Florence comes to town. A few days later, Matthew. Man's arrogance. Man builds cities like New Orleans. Cities in various places below sea level. Below sea level. How arrogant can you be? Below sea level. You're going to build a whole town. Then a storm comes, which... Got to come sooner or later and wipe out the whole thing. And folks tell me, where is God? No, I'll tell you what God was. God was telling them 50 years ago, don't build down here. Was it Emma that came through Texas? Who was it? Was it whatever? Harvey? Whatever the name of the storm was, in one of the areas, in one of the areas where it hit, a storm had hit in that area years ago. No life, loss of life, no loss of anything. You know why? Man hadn't built down there. But to make that money, sell houses, to advance the cause. I hadn't been a storm in a long time. This is perfectly good land. Let's go and do it. People bought, people was living. Here comes the created universe. All oh, the things that we do. It's rebelling. It's rebelling against our sin. And it's, 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 it's groaning to see that which God has. Just give me five minutes and I'm done. I'm not going back to the top. That which God has in store for us. It says the creature itself was brought into vanity, not willingly. Oh, the whole earth, everything on the earth tells us, don't live like you're living. You can't kill 4,000 babies a day and there be no storm. 
There'll be no wind, there'll be no rain, there'll be no rebellion. You, you can't ignore me. You can't endorse lifestyles that I've called an abomination. And there'll be no re repercussions. You, can, you, can't, you can't do the things. That, we, can't, we can't get to the point now in the name of political correctness. We call a he a she. And a she a he. And we do these things in the house of the Lord. And there be no... There's nothing. There's, there's nothing. And as good as he's been to black folk, as much as he's blessed us down through the years, former sons and daughters of slaves, look how the Lord raised us up. And many times now we're the first ones to turn our back on. First one, we, every little movement come out. Black Lives Matter, uh, uh, Kinetics, Woke, and all, we're the first one to grab hold. As good as the Lord has been. And you know what happens? As, as Adam continued to subject the created university stuff, it gets sick. It gets sick. Storms get worse. The hot is hotter, the cold is colder. And then somebody, well, what we're going to do is we're just going to make electric cars. Like that's going to make a difference. These little hybrids, they don't have any power. Oh, you, you just want to just, oh, please get out of the way. They don't have any power. They get, they get. If you're driving a hybrid, enjoy your hybrid. I'm, I'm not talking about the hybrid. I'm, I'm trying to make a point. I'm trying to show you that our problem is a sin problem. But God's going to solve it. Uh, and he says, look at this. He says, not willing, but even though it was brought into bondage, he says, by reasons of him that subjected it, but thank God, subjected us the same in hope. There's a better day coming. Do you love the Bible? Because the created universe itself also shall be delivered from, this, from the bondage of, the, of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. You know where we're headed? We're headed back to the greatest most environmentally safe, most environmentally friendly to the most, the most balanced time in, in the history of the universe. And it's recorded in Scripture. The time in the Bible that was just perfect and, and, and where everything was balanced. We find it in the Scripture, and you don't have to look far. You go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Perfection. Perfection. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Perfect. No sin. No wild nature. All the trees bore fruit. Animals were not hostile. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. Verse 2 says, and the earth was void. Studied in the Hebrew, it says, and the earth became, became right. void right. and dark. Studied it through the Jerusalem Bible, which is older than the King James. Studied the Hebrew text. The earth became, yes, sir. became something happened. Theologians call it Satan's flood. Something happened, and it was cataclysmic. It was sudden. And it put the lights out. And it destroyed all life, all human life, all the animals, all everything. Why you say human? Because he said to the humans, after he made Adam and Eve, he told them to replenish the earth. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish. Now, if you plenish, you're putting something there that's never been there. If you replenish, you're restocking. 
I'm in the Bible. And look at what we've done. What we've done. But the universe has hope. For we know that the whole created universe groaneth and travaileth uh, in pain until now. But not only the universe, but we do. Are you following me? Not only they, but ourselves. Even us. We who are saved, we struggle with the limitations of our humanity. The, the, the most saved, if you will, person in here struggles with their fallen humanity. The most, the most spiritual, the one in here who's speaking tongues more than the rest of us combined, still have thoughts, cravings, desires, humanity that they have to contend with. Fallen humanity. We are limited in what we can do and what we can't do. How long we will be here and how long we will not be here. We are limited. No one feels good all the time. No one is at their best all the time. No one handles every situation perfectly all the time. Everybody gets nasty and beside themselves sometimes. Oh no, I know so and so, and they ain't never been like that. You ain't, you hadn't been around. So we groan it in this, in this, in this, in this. This, this flesh will have cravings in it that you can't explain. And it's your flesh. Well, why do you feel a certain kind of way? You can go lay your head on a couch and talk for six months. And the answer may still end up being, I don't know. It is the nature of this. So, what do we do? We hope. In our um, statement of faith, we believe in the blessed hope, which is the rapture of the church of God, which is in Christ Jesus at his return. The blessed hope. We hope. We keep our eyes. We serve the Lord. Because even if, even if, even if, this is a reality. Even if you don't get that husband. And not everybody's going to get one. Because there ain't enough men to go around. Seriously. That means do the numbers, do the math. It's not enough. Even if you don't land that dream child. See, I'm helping you. Because some people. Because things have not worked out the way that they thought they would, feel like they've missed it in life. If you still have hope in what Jesus is going to do in us, your life is still worth living. And you're still a winner. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You should still be glad. You have reasons to be excited. Say, well, I thought I'd be a, a bishop by now, or a pastor by now, or the president by now, or whatever, 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 by now. I'm serious. Because there's some people who have to deal with deep disappointment because the devil has to, have told them that the train left the station. And left you standing there. Well I'm here to tell you. No it hasn't. Because even if you don't get it all. The way you want. Find that loved one. Who struggles with health issues. Not everybody can run. You read these self help books. And or these magazines. Well if you just work out. If you do this. If you do that. All that works. Providing ain't nothing wrong with your muscles. Providing God have given you the foundation of good health. What if you have a muscle-wasting disease? You can live what you want to live. You ain't going to be able to do it. 
for the most part, you either can sing or you can't. And a person who can't, can't be talked to. Some things you either can do or you can't do. If you do if, same thing with drawing. You either, you're either born with that ability. You cannot cultivate the ability to draw. Either God has blessed you to be an artist or you're not blessed to be one. Now, there are people who are blessed to be an artist and they're starving artists. They're laser artists. Or there are people who just don't draw anymore. But they still have that thing. There are others who, if they drew every day, they can't draw a straight line. It's not given to them. But it doesn't mean, am I right, prophet? It doesn't mean that they missed the boat. Your marriage failed. Oh, you know how the devil talk then. You know, see, I'm, I'm, I'm showing you something. I'm showing what was in Paul's mind as he surmised all this stuff. He's thinking about something. Because not everybody got married and stayed. And the first one worked until death. Doesn't happen to everybody. And, 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 and Paul, uh, the Lord, Moses, and Paul's writings account for that. Doesn't happen all the time. Everybody's children are not ideal. Oh, you watch it all. You watch all the time. Some of the big NFL athletes they have kids, and the kids are born, and sometimes the kid has a brain disease. Sometimes the kids have missing limbs. Dad big enough to the biggest offensive line, but the child is sick. Things happen, and, and people question. They question. You know, it hadn't worked out the way that I planned. I started my business, and I, I heard the Lord say, it was, I, I'm telling you, it was Jesus. The Lord told me that this thing cannot fail. It's going to work no matter what. The thing failed. And there you are with egg on your face. And the egg on your face is not egg from what other people are saying. You, you struggle when you're by yourself saying, Lord, did I miss you? And if I did, how do I trust from now on? How do I know what to do? See, see, the enemy gets into people's minds. Then we find the mighty apostle reckoning. I reckon. I can't explain it all, but I reckon that the sufferings of this present time whether you get an explanation for all of them or not, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. So, Lord, I thought, I thought I'd end up in a mansion, but now, Lord, now that I understand this, I'm satisfied in my apartment. I'm satisfied, Lord, that, that, that it didn't go the way that I thought, but I'm grateful for the way that it has gone because there is coming a day when the glorification, the thing that you will work in me, are so beyond human description. They're so beyond what we're able to tell people that when it happens, it's going to even free the entire universe Heaven, the atmosphere, the ionosphere, all of the spheres are going to clap their hands and say, we've been waiting for this. Praise the Lord. Paul tried to get a little more descript. And he says, for this mortal shall put on immortality. And this corruption shall put on in corruption, and we shall be changed. But what does that look like? I don't know, but it's going to happen. And so the hope of a suit is not enough to keep me going in Jesus. The hope of a car is not enough to keep me going in Jesus. The hope of a promotion is not enough to keep me going in Jesus. But the hope to be clothed in immortality. The hope to shed this flesh and to put on Christ. The hope to be 
just like Jesus. It not only is it enough to keep me going in this life, but it's also enough to sanctify me. It's enough to make me lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily tangles me up. It's enough to keep me from getting bogged down in life's minutia. The small, unimportant, irrelevant things. I want to pray today for saints who say, Lord, keep my eyes on the big picture. See, we're, we're, this, is, this is for winners, for achievers, for victory people. I want to see the big picture. Meet me on the altar. Not everybody understands this way of thinking. Not everybody sees it. But it's what Paul saw. And, and, and it's really necessary when you're, dealing, when you're dealing with tragedies and disappointments. Amen. Amen. Things that you, didn't, you never thought what would happen to you. You're dealing with a health issue that you never thought you would have. You never, if had they told you in a million years that would have happened to you or yours, you wouldn't have believed it. And yet, it happened. How do I see the future? How do I stay on fire? How do I rise above it? There's a day. There's a day. There's a coming glorification. And every man that hath this hope in him doth purify himself. Ooh, what a life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Obviously, I couldn't finish all this today, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. I hadn't even got to all things. Work together for the good. But we'll get to that. This is enough. This is enough. Lift your hands and begin to work.